Recently, I baked the traditional Australian and Aboriginal damper and bush breads to recognize Anzac Day, known as Veterans Day in Australia and New Zealand. For today's bake, I want to acknowledge New Zealand and that country's native people, the Maori. I'm really excited about this bake because it's a super cool variation of the traditional sourdough bread Americans have been baking for the past year. You may be the sourdough expert by now, but have you tried potato sourdough? Aha! If not, here's your chance. This New Zealand potato sourdough bread recipe originated with the Maori tribe who are New Zealand's indigenous people originally from the Polynesian Islands. This bread is a great blend of European and Maori culture. Thanks to the Europeans for introducing potatoes to New Zealand and the Maori for cleverly fermenting them to create a naturally occurring yeast to make bread. What an idea, since starch in the potatoes can produce yeast. In the Maori language, our bread bag today is called Rowena parau, meaning flour leavening. And the word rye which is part of the word rowena, means potato. As you've guessed, what makes this bread unique is the naturally occurring yeast created from the potato starter. It is very different from other potato sourdough starters you'll find online because this recipe has no processed ingredients like potato flakes and commercial yeast. This mashed potato concoction mixed with flour and sugar along with thyme is really all you need. It is said by some that this starter makes the best bread you'll ever eat. I guess we'll see. Since this bread is a type of sourdough, you know what that means. It's an easy, multi-day process. No, that was not an oxymoron. While it does take several days to create and feed the natural yeast, each day requires very little effort. So by day four, five, or six, depending on your environment, you should be able to make two loaves of bread. Let's get this fermentation started. For the entire multi-day process, from starting the fermentation to baking the bread, you'll need these ingredients. All-purpose flour, sugar, baking soda, salt, and approximately 30 ounces of baking potatoes, which is about one and three quarters to two pounds. Russets work very well for this recipe because they mash easily. And finally, water. The sweet starchy potatoes in this recipe create the yeast and sweetness to the bread and differs from the traditional sourdough in its firmness in making a heartier, denser bread, one without the large air pockets you might expect. This is how you begin and feed the starter.
The starter plate is bubbly and ready to be used in a bread. Now I have made this starter a couple of times and made this bread multiple times. I started this starter on day one. I fed days two and three. Now day four, you could begin baking the bread, but my starter was not ready. So I fed it another two more days. So for me, this is day six. If you're making a starter for the first time, it may take you six days to get to the point where you can bake bread. But once you get the starter going, it will flourish and you will do fine. So let's take a look at it. Nice, look at the bubbles. And it hasn't increased too much in size, but that's what this sourdough is going to look like. Summertime is the best time to make sourdough because of the warm temperatures. Also, don't be alarmed if there's a sour odor. That means it's working and fermenting nicely, hence the name sourdough. So we're making two loaves of bread today using most of the starter. So since it took me two extra days of feeding, I won't, will not be using all of my starter. If you're able to bake your bread on day four, then use all of the starter. And that'll be approximately four to four and a half cups. So since I had to feed mine two extra days, I just measured my starter into a big measuring cup and I've got a little over four cups here. Totally fine, it, it doesn't have to be exact. Then I just put the rest of the starter in another bowl and I'm just gonna continue to feed this and continue to make bread. So in a large bowl, you're gonna sift five cups of flour. I'm on my last cup here, my fifth cup, but again, as always, you wanna make sure to scoop your flour in your measuring cup. Now this is meant to be a dense bread, so we wanna help it a little bit because those potatoes are just gonna make it really firm. And so sifting the flour helps the bread be a little bit lighter. And so to that, we're gonna add one teaspoon of salt. Let's go ahead and whisk our salt and flour together. Just mix it up fairly well before we add our starter. So then we're gonna make a well in the center of our flour mixture here. Try not to make a mess. And then we're going to pour in my four, it's a little bit over four cups of starter. It's a pretty wet starter, which means we likely will not have to add any liquid to it. We're gonna add a teaspoon of baking soda. Even though this is na has naturally occurring yeast in it, we are gonna help it a little bit with just a little bit of baking soda instead of commercial yeast. We just sprinkle over baking soda. And what I like about this is in a few minutes, if you just wait before you mix it, you'll see the acid in the sourdough react with the baking soda and it'll start to bubble like you would typically see with commercial yeast when you add warm water and let it sit for a few minutes and it activates. That's what's gonna happen with our baking soda here. Kind of cool. All right, check it out. Look at those little bubbles that have formed from that baking soda. Granted, you don't have to let this sit. You can go ahead and start mixing, but I like to see the little bubbles. I thought it'd be cool to show you but it's not required to let it sit. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna mix in the sourdough with our flour, just using a sturdy spoon or spatula. What I like about this sourdough as opposed to just a regular bread, as I'm mixing this in, I can totally feel how light and fluffy that sourdough is as it's mixing in with the flour. Now you may need to add as much as a cup of water as you're mixing this in. I obviously don't need any water. I think this is perfect as is. So when you get to this stage, it should be sticky. If it's not sticky enough, then add a little bit of liquid to it. If it feels too sticky, then you can add some flour. But we don't need to add flour here because we're going to need this right now. So you need to prepare a surface on which you can knead. So I'm gonna grab my handy towel here. This is where I do love to knead on a cutting board and I only use this board for kneading so it stays clean. We're gonna add some flour to our work surface. You're going to knead this like a traditional bread dough. Some sourdough breads you, you don't really want to because you don't want to deflate it, but this one's different. And then scoop your dough out onto your floured surface. All right, if you could tell, this dough is pretty, it's a pretty wet dough. So we definitely need to flour our hands. I like it, such a soft dough. Well, of course, as we knead it, it'll develop the gluten and it won't be quite as soft. But whenever you're kneading dough, particularly with sourdough, make sure that you try to keep it sort of a wet dough because the bread needs water. It needs to be hydrated to help it really rise. 10 minutes, no longer, we don't want to overwork the dough. All right, my kneading time is up. If you were baking this bread and at this stage on day four, then you have no additional starter. 
Now, I do have additional starter because I fed for two more days. So I don't have to do this next step because I already have a starter ready to go, but we need to build from the starter and make a baby one. So if you are baking your bread on day four, then we used all of our starter, right? So we have to create a new one. So what you wanna do is pinch off about two tablespoons worth of dough. And this is gonna sound a little bit weird because it's a dough, it's not like a liquid of any, of any kind. Then you're going to place that dough around somewhere where it can, where you can cover it and let it rise. I'm just putting mine in a small bowl. You could put it in a mason jar, whatever you want to do. And then starting tomorrow, I'm going to feed this dough just like I did the liquid portion of it, adding potato starch, sugar, stirring it up and adding flour if I need to in order for it to be the consistency of pancake batter. So that's it. That's your starter for making a new plant to build off of for future sourdough loaves. So cover your bowl with plastic wrap and then sit it in a warm place overnight so it can start to relax and start to activate and rise again. I put mine in the oven with the light on and that keeps it nice and warm about 80 degrees. Perfect. If you understand sourdough, then you know that salt is typically not found in the starter. Well, what I've learned is that you can have a very small percentage of salt and the starter will still grow. It just might grow at a slower rate because salt can inhibit some of the time and duration it takes for sourdough to grow, for yeast to develop. So that's why a lot of times you see recipes where salt is added during the kneading process instead of when the liquid is added because the recipe is trying to separate the salt from interacting with the yeast too soon or it'll slow down the activation. So yes, we do have salt in our dough, but there's not enough for it to hurt it too much. It will still grow, still activate, and make a great loaf of bread. If you're not ready to bake bread in the next few days, what you could do is feed it for the day or two to get it back to that nice liquid consistency, that pancake batter consistency. Then put it in the fridge like you would normally put sourdough and just let it sit and hang out for a few days. You don't have to feed it every day if you let it go dormant in the refrigerator in a cold environment. Every few days, just feed it. And then when you're ready to make bread again, take it out about 24 hours before you wanna bake it or so. Feed it aggressively and make sure that you get those a little few bubbles and it tells you it's activated by the time you're ready to bake it. Unlike many yeast spread recipes, including the traditional sourdough, there is no rising time for this bread. Surprise! This bread is baked with real potatoes, mashed potatoes to be exact, so it's meant to be somewhat of a dense, little heavier dough than a traditional sourdough. It will not rise except during the baking process with the help of baking soda. You can bake your loaves in a couple of different ways. So one way is to use a lightly floured parchment lined cookie sheet or a, brown, or a round baking pan, just make sure it's at least eight inches in diameter. Or you could use a Dutch oven lined with parchment paper. So if you use the cookie sheet, it will cause the dough to crust very quickly in the oven, potentially causing blowouts in the dough as it expands, see my picks, and hardens. The Dutch oven, its sides conduct heat more evenly within the pot to keep the dough soft as it rises, preventing random blowouts in the dough. The Dutch oven is probably my preferred method in baking this bread because it will produce a hard exterior, but not quite as crunchy or as brown. Regardless, if you create your own weak points by adding slits in the dough, you can control where most of the dough expands, preventing random blowouts that will likely give your final bread bake an awkward shape. See my picks for that too. We're going to use both methods today since we're baking two loaves of bread because I wanna compare the rise and bake of both and I want you to see that. Since we're starting with the Dutch oven, what we need to do is place the Dutch oven in the oven and preheat the oven to 400 degrees because we wanna heat up the sides and bottom of the pot before we bake the bread. That way it eliminates the extra time needed to heat up the pot while it bakes the bread. So we're going to go ahead and place our Dutch oven in the oven and preheat it to 400 degrees. Since we're making two loaves today, let's go ahead and divide our one large dough round here into two pieces. So I just shaped it so that I can see somewhat of a symmetrical two pieces here. And then I'm just going to cut it roughly down the center. They don't have to be perfectly equally sized. I'm going to place one aside for now. For each of our loaves, I want to honor the Maori culture. So in doing so, we're gonna make some artisan designs using both cuts 
and a stencil, haha, that's something new, isn't it, that are traditional to the Maori people. For our first off, do you see all those little folds? I really wanna smooth this out because if you have too many folds in your loaf, you're creating a weak spot. And when you do that, that's where it's gonna, the bread's gonna blow out. So we wanna make sure it's smooth all around, particularly on the top. If, as it's sitting on the bottom, it's probably gonna be okay. But as long as the top and the sides are relatively smooth. Since our Dutch oven is in the oven, we will be working on top of parchment paper. Go ahead and lightly flour your parchment paper. And then we're going to place our dough round on top of it in the center. You're gonna lightly flour two sides. So here's what we're gonna do with this one. We're gonna create slits on either side to create those weak points to allow the dough to rise without forcing new weak points. And then we're gonna leave space in the center to put our stencil. Flouring where we put the cuts is going to dry out the top of the dough and it'll make just cutting it a little easier. Now we're gonna add about a quarter inch cut marks around the edge. I'm gonna do the same on the other side. About a quarter inch. Again, we're creating that forced weak point for expansion as it rises so it doesn't create a lot of new ones and give us a weird looking dough. Okay, now we're gonna add our Mari Tamoko stencil. Okay, so I basically just found an unfurled fern online, traced it on parchment paper and cut it out and that's what's gonna create the stencil for our bread. So Taimoko simply means permanent tattoo, which is typical on the face in the Maori culture. Maori people practice face tattooing as a sign of identity and prestige, with each tattooed face being unique. This rite of passage for the Maori people is like a fingerprint for each person. So I linked a really cool website below the description that tells all about the history and culture of Maori tattooing. So if this is of any interest to you, you should totally check it out. So for us today, I've made this particular tattoo of a koru, which is a spiral. The koru shape looks like and comes from the symbolism of an unfurled fern leaf since New Zealand has some of the most beautiful ferns in the world. This koru symbol represents new beginnings, growth and harmony. So you simply just place your stencil over the center of it, like I did here. And we're going to add a little bit of flour. Now don't add too much flour for the stencil because then you'll have this, this thick layer of flour and that's not gonna be pretty for anybody. So just lightly flour over the dough where the stencil is not covering. Okay, that's probably good. Then we're carefully going to lift up the stencil. And now you can see my koru. This koru shape conveys the idea of perpetual movement in its circular formation here, while the intercoil that you see here suggests returning to the point of origin. Wow, I feel like this bread is like communion bread. Such meaning and religious significance. So there you go, it's ready for the oven. My oven timer just went off, it's preset at 400 degrees, and I've carefully removed my Dutch oven from the oven because it's super hot. So now all we have to do is carefully lift our parchment paper, try not to close up the slits that we made, and then just sit it in our Dutch oven, like so. Just take a look at the inside here. That's it. We don't need to put the lid on it because then it won't brown at all. So we can leave the lid off, it's okay. So we're gonna place this in the oven and we're gonna bake it for 40 to 50 minutes until golden brown or the internal temperature reaches 190 degrees. For me, I'm gonna rely on the temperature uh, setting because the golden brown isn't gonna work as much in a Dutch oven because it doesn't have that direct heat to turn it brown. Start checking it at 40 and then at every five to 10 minutes to that until you reach that 190 degree mark. And then it's ready. We're gonna work with the other half because we're gonna bake it on a cookie sheet instead of the Dutch oven. So go ahead and line your cookie sheet with parchment paper and do add a little bit of flour. I like the flour because it gives it that nice rustic but also artisan look. And we're gonna place our dough round, our second one on top of that. And for some reason mine's not very round. So just shape it till it's in that round. And so for this one, I'm gonna flat it out a little bit because this dough is gonna rise really high and it's gonna almost be like a ball when it's baked. We're going to cut slits into it. Scoring allows for expansion during the rise. It creates the weak points, letting you control exactly where you want the bread to crack during the baking. So for this, we're gonna make a fern using slits from a knife. You wanna go ahead and flour the top of your bread because you wanna dry it out a little bit. It makes it easier to score the bread. We're gonna start from one end to the other and I'm gonna put about a quarter of an inch slit all the way down. 
Okay, and that's where the biggest rise and expansion is going to occur is that larger line. So now we're gonna make the leaves from off of the fern. So just rotate the, wherever you need to. Start about one end and you wanna leave space between all of the lines, including the main one, because we want to be able to see little scars of the fern leaves as it bakes. So we're gonna add a slit just at an angle going up then just about an inch down, add another one, and they'll get just a little bit bigger, a little bit longer as you go, and then they get a little narrower again. Okay, so that's one side. Now we're gonna do this side. Notice the big slit in the center is already starting to expand. That's our cut fern. We're going to repeat the steps that we did for the previous loaf, and we're gonna bake this loaf at 400 degrees for the same amount of time, 40 to 55 minutes, or until golden brown and the internal temperature reaches 190 degrees. So let's get in the oven, and then we'll take a look at both of them. Both breads are baked. Let's take a closer look. All right, this one was baked in the Dutch oven. Notice our stencil still has that pretty flower design on top. So in order to control the rise, we created our slits around it. So if we did not do this with our bread, then we likely would have had blowouts anywhere else on the bread, on the top, in the middle, on the edges. The other one was baked on the cookie sheet. Okay, it is a little bit browner. And of course you can still see our fern-like cuts in the bread, in the dough. Now, they're not super defined, they're more like little scars, but they do exist. So you can see where the bigger one in the center controlled a lot of the rise and the expansion, and then the little leaves on the exterior are just, they just expanded a little bit, but not too much. But we ended up with a pretty loaf that didn't really blow out anywhere. So that actually worked out really well. But remember at the, the bottom, we had some folds and creases, and notice they did separate. So I'm glad that it separated on the bottom, then on the top, because that's where we want it to look pretty. Two beautiful loaves, baked in a Dutch oven, or on a cookie sheet, you're safe both ways. Let's look at the center. It's cutting very nicely. All right, remember I told you this is gonna be a denser bread. It's gonna have a firmer crumb to it, and it does. We've got a few air pockets, but not too many. We don't expect that for a potato sourdough. Okay, let's tear into it a little bit. Yep, it stretches. It's got a little bit of a glutinous stretch to it. Let's give it a taste. Well, my gluten-eating friend is joining us today to compare the texture and flavors. Kiora, Scott? Let's eat some gluten. <laughs> All right, glad you're here because I'm really excited for you to talk about this bread. You know, you've been eating a lot of potato sourdough breads lately, so you're kind of the expert when it comes to potato sourdough, <laughs> I think. So if you will, just give one of these a taste and I'll just quickly describe it just to remind you what it is. So this recipe is a traditional Maori potato sourdough bread from New Zealand. It includes a starter plant, also known as the bug. The starter is made with mashed potatoes, sugar, flour, and water. And then the bread itself contains the starter that you're eating, also regular flour, salt, and baking soda. So very few ingredients. So it is the potato starter that gives its unique sour. What are your thoughts? Mashed potato bread, huh? Mashed potato bread, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not as dense as previous versions that you've made, so what's different this time? Yes, I've made quite a few of these breads, and what I'm learning is that the longer and more patient you are in allowing your sourdough to rise and get bubbly, then the lighter dough you're going to have in the form of bread. Yeah, I don't really taste potato very much. If anything, it's it's just kind of a subtle flavor, very very subtle sour, and mostly I, I taste the sour in the uh, in the crust. It's a good sourdough bread. I enjoy it every single time that you make it. Yeah, he's had a lot lately. Uh, you know, they do say in New Zealand that this is likely the best bread you'll ever eat. It's kind of not fair to ask you that question because you've eaten a lot of bread. How does it compare to a standard bread? You think? It would be in the top 20 breads. <laughs> it's good. I mean, yeah. I'm not saying it, it's not good. But it's different than a yeast bread. If anyone's made sourdough and you've eaten sourdough, you know it's a denser bread. So it does have a different flavor. So as far as sourdough breads are concerned... Yeah, it's very good. Very good bread. Yeah. All right. Well, you can eat this bread hot out of the oven with butter and jam. In New Zealand, it's commonly eaten with golden syrup. Have you ever heard of that? Golden syrup? Honey? No! You ready to learn something new? 
Just one thing. Okay, well, it's a sweetener made from processed sugar cane or sugar beet juice. Golden syrup is the color of honey, so you're close, but it pours like corn syrup, so it's very thick, mm -hmm. and it tastes buttery and caramely. Oh, interesting. Very different. I think this is a very interesting bread. So thanks to the starter, it really is the gift that keeps on giving. If you're bored with a traditional sourdough starter, try this version and learn a little Maori language and culture in the process. You just might be inspired to take a trip to New Zealand. With that, thanks for watching. Please subscribe to my channel and share my videos with your family and friends. I appreciate you. Until next time, te nakota, ha iraha. Go back the world.